bird and I can give it to Mr. Imbriali to get you kicked out of school. That guy doesn't oh, no. like me. Everyone's going to stay in dress code now. I think Imbriali <laughs> likes you. Yeah. Um, oh, you, you guys want to meet my pet lobster? Yes. I'm so glad I'm recording this. <laughs> how do you put the camera? I mean, it's a really cool lobster. Wait, how do you right, put show the me camera? The, show me the lobster. Just how turn the phone. The... Just turn the phone. Oh. Fine. So Did when you... the lobster... The first shed, it's like skin. It scared Javi because he thought it died. <laughs> so do you not want to – are you not going to eat it? No, it's not going to grow that big. Oh. Okay. So if it did, you would eat it? I literally got that thing for the sole purpose of saying, hey, you guys want to see my pet lobster? <laughs> <laughs> for this moment. Pretty much. Like one of these days, we're all going to be on a video call, and I'm going to show off my pet lobster. I – um. I actually met this dude, and we we only became friends because he he heard that I had a pet lobster. So that's why he like you know showed initiative to you know become friends with me. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. Um, <laughs> I am in charge of this class. Uh, please uh, use the chat uh, function if you have questions or if you want to say something. Um, I'm not gonna necessarily make make you all mute yourself because you guys aren't very loud. Um, but I may ask you to mute yourself. Um, especially if you're Javi Javier, mute yourself because you're like putting things away and all the rest. Um, I am going to ask, because this is a class, I am going to ask that you um, take notes. And um, I, I'm going to ask for everyone, uh, whether you're live or whether you're doing it um, uh, delayed sometime today, um, I am going to make it an assignment. And so I am going to have you just take a, like a picture or one page uh, of of your notes okay so and then post that so that would be your assignment today uh whether you're in my class now or you are doing it uh later okay so that's kind of what's going on um okay just reading what you guys have up i'm here. gonna leave in like 10 minutes because i have to go do some things okay well so. then you can just you can it's good to see you, javier you can just lo log off and uh and uh go do your thing and then watch it tonight all right. Okay. okay, I'll be here for okay, a cool. little bit, though. All right. Okay. Yeah, I'm so glad you got to see Javier. Okay, so yeah, uh, grab something to write with, and uh, let me just... Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and put up a PowerPoint. Uh, so, um, and yeah, please... You know what? Actually, if you have a question... Just unmute yourself and and throw that question out because when I am presenting, um, I don't uh, I can't see all the chat stuff. Um, I'll just have like the PowerPoint pulled up, so um, it kind of makes it a little difficult. Okay, let me go ahead and present. Um, yeah, do 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 do. Okay, so hold on. Where's the PowerPoint? Oh, there it is. Okay, can you guys see this? Um, uh, Jared, let me know if you can see this. Yes. Can you see me too, Jared? Yes. Okay, I just wasn't sure if like both were going on because uh, I can't see it from from the way you guys can see it. Okay, so uh, the next chapter is on the 1970s. We're just going to spend like a little bit of this week and beginning of next week on the 1970s and then move move on. We've already talked about Vietnam. Um, hopefully you learned something. Uh, let me say something before I get started on, on, actual, on the actual content. Um, reading test, and this, this applies to everyone in my class um, and everyone, you know, everyone actually here logged in and then people that are um that are watching this the, the video delayed um when it comes to test questions i tried to make it really clear that i wanted you, the written portions to be you know thought out to be complete sentences to be things with like capitalization and and periods and you know just basic grammar because you guys are 11th graders um and i didn't always get that uh so you know please do that uh your final is basically i don't know exactly what it's going to be but i do know it's going to be 
um, like totally written. Um, it's not going to be multiple choice questions. It's going to be you writing. So please, please, please use regular English. You know, if I ask you a question, a complete sentence, um, anyway, just don't be lazy with it. Uh, if you're lazy with that kind of stuff, it's just going to hurt your grade. Um, and I tried to make that really clear before the test, but apparently it needs to be said again. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Anyone have anything to say about that? Speaking of the test, when are we going to get that back? Uh, I'm trying to get rid them all today. Uh, I might not be able to, but I'll, I hopefully will by the end of the week. Is that cool? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I try to stay up on grading in this online system. Um, okay. So anyway, let's talk about the 1970s a little bit. And um, particularly Nixon is the main thing we're going to talk about today. Um, this is the years that Nixon was president. Um, he was elected in 68. And uh, so he took over in 69 and he resigned. Uh, the big thing to know about Nixon is he's the only president to ever resign in office. And so he resigned in 1973. Okay, we're going to look at kind of a timeline of that sort of thing. And so there he is waving the uh, peace signs, the victory signs. Um, and, um, uh, he is from California. He was married. I don't know if you guys know this, but Riverside, um, Nixon was married at the mission Inn in Riverside. He's from your Belinda, uh, which is right off the 91 when you guys like, go toward orange County or into orange County. Um, so he's like the most local president, uh, that we have. And, um, anyway, uh, he also is, you know, the one who resigned. Hey, um, oh, these are kind of in a weird order. Let's uh, let's just show the whole slide here. Um, so here are things to take note on. Uh, I asked you this question already about the silent majority, uh, but the idea behind silent, uh, the concept of the silent majority, and it's there's a lot of truth to it. Nixon talked about that there was a silent majority of people that were basically the not hippies of the society. Um, this was the '60s, late '60s. And he's basically saying, you know, there's all these radicals out there. There's all these people that are protesting war and, you know, protesting the way society is done and the sexual revolution and everything else. And he's like, the vast majority of people are more quiet. And so you don't necessarily hear what they have to say, but they are the majority. And so this is who he appeals to. Um, we don't want radical change. Um, we don't want, you know, socialism. Uh, a lot of the hippies were pretty liberal when it came to that. Um, so we want, you know, free market uh, capitalism. Uh, we want law and order. Uh, we talked about with the civil rights movement, there's a bunch of race riots uh, in pretty much every city in the country. Um, so we want to kind of return to stability. And this is kind of what he appealed to. Um, he also appealed to, and this is complicated, um, I'm going to kind of, I don't want to, um, I don't want to like skew your understanding of this. I, I feel like this is something that still to this day, people need to investigate and try to find out themselves. And there's a lot of, uh, different interpretations of how to kind of understand Nixon's Southern strategy. But the reality is, is that the South does begin to vote Republican for the first time in history when they, uh, with Nixon. Uh, the South had always been Democrat, and the Democratic Party had always been the party of of uh, segregation until around the time of Kennedy. Um, and so the, um, the the Southern strategy is basically an attempt for uh, Southerners uh, to get Southerners to vote Republican because the Democratic Party had abandoned them. Okay, um, and it worked. Uh, starting in 72 and and it's not like a complete shift but starting in 72 you start seeing southern states go republican for the first time ever um and if you fast forward to today southern states are staunchly republican uh whereas they used to be staunchly democrat um and so part of the southern strategy is is this you know they're, it's getting them to vote republican okay that's the basic idea behind it and uh, the idea is that Southern states, you know, there's there's clearly this racial element. There's clearly this idea of uh, the white majority in the South feels like that um, 
that the federal government has taken their rights um, and infringed on their rights and, you know, has pushed civil rights. Hey, okay? um, you know, because it really gets into ideas of self-government. You know, if Alabama can govern itself, then the governor of Alabama can say we won't allow blacks in the University of Alabama. Okay? That's self-government in their thinking. But of course, with the civil rights movement, the push was, no, you're denying these individuals' rights. Okay? Um, and so, you know, states' rights and civil rights are in conflict in the civil rights movement. And Nixon comes along and well, he doesn't try to undo civil rights by any means, but he does try to kind of say, hey, we want the states to have more rights and, and not infringe on the power of the states. And so Southerners heard that and said, OK, so that, you know, that's what we want to hear. And so they, they begin to vote for Nixon. Now, Nixon didn't do anything major, at least to um, to like undo civil rights legislation. Um, but he did kind of shift the pendulum more to states' rights. Now, let me give you kind of one example, and then I actually kind of want to hear from you guys. Um, one example is busing. Um, you know, with civil rights legislation, you started seeing in the late 60s um, busing for public schools. And so kids would be taken to one area, which was like a black neighborhood, and be they would go from that area to a white neighborhood to go to school there, and so they would be bused. And so this was a way to kind of undo – um, undo segregation by m having kids go to these different schools, um, in different neighborhoods, even. Um, and sometimes busing white kids or kids from a white neighborhood into a black neighborhood to go to school there. Um, this starts being done in the 60s, and and uh, Nixon begins to say and and get support in the South by saying. You know, we're not going to bust your kids from one neighborhood to another. This doesn't make sense. We're going to let local school districts kind of decide for themselves what to do with those kids. And people see this as his Nixon's critics say, well, he's undoing the civil rights movement and the gains of the civil rights movement. OK, um, all that said, um, would someone uh, like to chime in or I'm going to call on someone uh, does that make sense what the Southern strategy is and why it's controversial? Faith, I'm just going to ask you, why don't you unmute yourself? Does, do you kind of understand what I mean by the Southern strategy and do you understand why it's even still to this day kind of controversial? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah. Any questions from anybody? Okay. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, but anyway, so you see there's major shifts in American politics and society that are going on. Um, and, you know, for the first time ever, Southerners vote Republican. This had never happened since, you know, the beginning of these parties. The Republican Party, remember, was the party of Lincoln and the party of stopping the spread of slavery back in the 1860s, 1850s and 60s. That's how it got started. Anyway, moving on now. Um the economy, and I want you to know this term, I don't define it here, uh, but the term is stagflation. So I want you to write in your notes what it means. Um, basically, it's this. It's kind of a dumb made up term, but it means that the that the economy was stagnant, as in it wasn't growing, um, and there was inflation. So when the economy is not growing and there's inflation, what really that means is the cost of living is more and more, you know, it's higher and more difficult for people because they're not getting raises, they're, you know, and goods are costing more and all the rest. Um, so there's stagflation in the economy of the 1970s. Really, the 1970s is one is the era of since World War II and since the Great Depression. Really, the 30s and then the 70s, not to the same extent, but the 70s is a time where the economy really dipped and really kind of dragged. And there's kind of two main reasons for that. And I want you to write down these two main reasons. One is um, the government spent a lot of money because of the uh, Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson. Okay? And so you had massive spending programs, okay? um, which, which meant taxes were pretty high. And then secondly, the government was spending a lot of money on the Vietnam War and, and had been. And so with large amounts of spending, 
um, and taxation to support that uh, and and debt, you really have the situation to where uh, you kind of cripple the economy. Um, talking about this economy, that's really the big question. One of the big questions behind the the coronavirus you know situation we're in right now. This is really a historic moment, and um, I think I remember a student, maybe one of you guys, asked me about like, oh, do you think the coronavirus is going to be in history textbooks? And this was like back in December, and I'm like, I don't know. I guess it depends on what happens with it. But yeah, for sure, <laughs> the moment you're living in right now will for sure be in history textbooks, particularly if. There's a huge economic downturn because of it. I'm not saying there's going to be, but um, it, it, there, it's certainly going to have economic effects. Hopefully just short-term economic effects, but there are going to be economic effects. Uh, any questions at this point? You can ask me about the coronavirus if you want to. I probably don't know the answer. Okay. Um, you have it. Yeah, what's up? You have the coronavirus? Have I do not have it. I My... Um, my father-in-law and uh, my wife's stepmom had it. Um, when so did they have it? They had it months ago, like back in March. We oh, were okay. in school when they had it. The doctors didn't test them, but then they went back and tested them and, and found out that they had it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Um Moving on, uh, I want you to know this other term is called detente. Detente is a weird word, and what it means is uh, sort of the easing or the lessening of tensions uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. Okay, so we're talking about the Cold War still. We're still in the Cold War, and Nixon. Um, Nixon's complicated. There's a lot with Nixon, and um, you know, is he liberal? Is he conservative? Um, people, you can still kind of debate that. Um, because when it came to the Soviet Union, Nixon was probably the most kind of gracious president to the evil Russian empire of any president up to that point. Um, and so the, the, this cold war tensions kind of ease, he goes to China and he goes to Russia, he goes to these communist countries, meets with their leaders and tries to promote a policy to where, uh, there is not this kind of like brink of warfare thing, brinkmanship. Uh, policy, but more of a um, a uh, mutual understanding a little bit. Uh, the beginning of trade with these countries, I mean, that trade with China is huge uh, right now. That sounded very Trump-esque. I'm like, huge? It was China, huge. Um, but, um, but, you know, that kind of thing starts with uh, Nixon and with his detente policies. Um, lastly, two things that you could consider in some ways – liberal if you want to uh it's nixon's administration and he's not the only one to do this but nixon's administration that begins the epa that is the environmental protection association uh for the first time the federal government really regulates things when it comes to pollution and environmental impact of of you know uh car emissions and and all these kinds of things you start seeing of uh, you know factory emissions uh, you start seeing the federal government regulating that sort of thing. And that is a massive step for the federal government to get involved in doing and regulating, um, you know, the environmental impact of various things. And then last, lastly, we talked about this when we talked about civil rights, but it's during the Nixon administration um, that affirmative action, and he signs uh, bills that support affirmative action into law. And so Nixon, when it comes to overall his presidency, um, he's not, he's kind of moderate. He's not liberal. He's not conservative. Um, he's a politician that was able to make deals and get things done. Um, he really wasn't, you know, a super controversial figure in a lot of ways at first with a lot of his policies. Um, he did, you know, like, as we said, he, he did some things in Vietnam and ordered some things done in Vietnam that were maybe pretty sketchy, but at the same time, he was eventually the president that got the troops out and that tried to turn the war back over to the Vietnamese. Um, so he's he's pretty complicated in, in trying to figure out how to assess Nixon. Uh, he's not a this super conservative Republican. He's certainly not a liberal Democrat. Um, 
is kind of in an era that that's different from our own and uh, it takes a lot of you know reading and trying to figure out how best to understand uh, his legacy but the reality is is that his legacy is is so shaped by and influenced by uh, the Watergate scandal to which I believe we turn to next uh, timeline of the Watergate scandal okay I want to need your uh, assistance on this this is straight from um, I believe it's the Washington Post which is one of the newspapers who um, wrote extensively about the Watergate and broke stories about Watergate and then later on they made a, a timeline okay so um, I have bold terms in there so you don't need to write down everything but if it's bold I want you to write it down in your notes um, but I'm also going to call on people to uh, to read. Okay, um, and let me see here. I'm going to exit this out for a second. Um, I need to know who's in the classroom. Um, let's see here. We got Faith, Jared, Matthew. Okay, I might forget some of you guys. I'm sorry. Lexi, Bailey, Brooke. Hello, Brooke. I don't think I've seen you. Faith, Jay, Jenna. Jared, Matthew. Okay, um, I'll try to remember and call you guys out. Um, are we all in the same order? Is, is this order the same for everybody? Maybe we can do with that. Um, no. It's not? So, because I have it, me, Lexi, Bailey, that's not the same order for you? It's, I think it's, yeah, it's alphabetical. And then we're so at the top. That's at the top, and then it puts you in the middle where you'd be al alphabetically. Okay. So um, it's basically the same other than us and you. Do we need our yeah, books? Okay, so it's, it's the same, but you don't know where you'll go. Um, I mean, okay. right now, the bottom. We'll, so. try, we'll try to do this in alphabetical order because uh, I want your participation. So um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull this up, and uh, we'll start with uh, Lexi, right? And... Um, and you, yeah, can you read the first two things on this timeline? 1968. You got to unmute yourself. You click the microphone button. Lexi Montgomery. I think she clicked the wrong button. <laughs> She's out of here. Bailey Brzezinski, <laughs> it's up to you. And then Brooke. Okay, Bailey, read the first two. Okay, so just the first two. Yeah, 68 and 69. November 5th, Richard Milhouse Nixon, the 55-year-old former vice president who lost the presidency for the Republicans in 1960, reclaims it by defeating Hubert Humphrey, in one of the closest elections in U.S. history. 1969, January 21st, Nixon is inaugurated as the 37th president of the United States. And if you guys remember the 68 election was the really controversial one where um, Bobby Kennedy is shot and George Wallace runs against um, uh, Nixon and Humphrey and it's just a crazy election. Okay, 1971, all these things happen in 71. Um, Brooke, can you read uh, these two, June 13th and then down to September 3rd? Okay. Um, I have to find how to get to the screen again. Oops. Okay. Um, June 13th, the New York Times begins publishing the Pentagon Papers, the Defense Department's secret history of the Vietnam War. September 3rd, the White House plumbers unit named for their orders to plug leaks in the administration burglarizes a psychiatrist office to find files on Daniel Ellsberg, the former defense analyst who leaked the Pentagon Papers. Okay, so things we uh, find out from 71 is, one, there were things being done in Vietnam that, that weren't public, uh, but the administration had documents of. Um, the secret history of the Pentagon Papers, and two, people who, who release that to the public. Um, you know, the White House had a unit called the Plumbers that were going to fix leaks and not let that, you know, try to not let that information get out. Okay, and so that's just kind of, all this is kind of background to what happens with Watergate. Okay, next slide is on Watergate and um, 
let's see here. Alexi, uh, or Alexis, sorry. Um, are you able to get on mic now? You figured this out? I, I got it now. <laughs> you got it. Good job. Okay. Why don't you, um, why don't you read that first thing from June 17th? Uh, okay. Five men, one of whom says he used to work for the CIA, are arrested at 2.30 a.m. trying to bug the offices of the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate Hotel and Computer Complex. Okay. Uh, so Watergate, go, you know, it is the name of a hotel that has uh, that houses the Democratic National Committee. Okay, so and I want you to write this down. It says CRP. This was a group of people called the Committee to Reelect the President. So Nixon is president. This is in '72. He's running for reelection, and the Committee to Reelect the President, which is also known as Creep, which is a great name, um, they. They break into, and they are arrested for breaking into um, the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate Hotel. So that's what the Watergate incident is all about. It's all about people breaking into the headquarters. And the question is, like, were these people working for the president? Um, and that's that's a you know, and, and did the president know uh, what was going on? So that's kind of what the issue at hand is. Um, Faith, uh, can you read? October 10th and 7th and November 7th. Okay. FBI agents established that the Watergate break breaking system break in systems from a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage conducted on behalf of the Nixon reelection effort. Nixon is reelected in one of the largest landslides in American political history, taking more than 60% of the vote and crushing the Democratic nominee, Senator George McGovern of South Dakota. Okay, so a couple things. Um, you know, there, there's information that's known, and the FBI is like, uh, people working for the president broke into the Watergate Hotel. Um, but the reality is Nixon still ran for re-election with some of this in, in the public, not all of it, but some of this in the public. It did not hurt him whatsoever. The election of 72, people voted for Nixon in a landslide, and I have a map of the Electoral College. Um, it is the most one-sided election in the modern era. This is the way the vote went. Um, McGovern won Massachusetts. He didn't even win his home state of South Dakota. Um, Nixon won everything else. Okay. That that map is just mind-boggling. Okay. So the 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 crazy thing about Watergate is the whole break-in had to do with like they're trying to get dirt on McGovern to help them in their campaign against McGovern. They didn't need any help. Nixon was, you know, he won in a landslide, he didn't really need to uh, uh, help, uh, you know, he didn't really need to do anything dirty to get there. Uh, but the reality is that he did, or his cam campaign and people did. Okay, so uh, 1973, um, Jay, why don't you uh, read uh, the first couple ones with 1973? April 30th 19, and May 18th. 1973 of April, April 30th. Nixon's top White House staffers resign over the scandal. White House counsel John Dean is fired. May 18th, the Senate Watergate Committee begins its nationally televised hearings. Attorney General designate Elliot Richardson, Taft's former solicitor, General Archibald Cox. <laughs> As the Justice Department's uh, special prosecutor for Watergate, June 3rd, John Dean has told Watergate investigators that he discussed the Watergate cover-up with President Nixon at least 35 times. Okay, um, so people are resigning, and uh, we're going to go on. Uh, 1973, July 23rd. Um, Let's see here. Jenna, you want to read that? The first two?
Okay, I'll do it. July 23rd, Nixon refuses to turn over the presidential tape recordings. So there was a system of tape recordings of phone conversations in the White House that was already in place. Nixon didn't put it there. But basically, if you picked up the telephone, a tape would record. And um, the uh, Congress demands that he turn them over. Nixon refuses to turn them over uh, to the Senate uh, Watergate Committee or the special prosecutor. October 20th, the Saturday Night Massacre. Nixon ordered his attorney general to fire independent prosecutor Archibald Cox. Both attorney general and his deputy refused and were fired. So Nixon's firing people who aren't, you know, who are investigating him. Um, and so that clearly kind of makes him look guilty. Uh, November 17th, Nixon declares on TV in a speech, I am not a crook, famous line, maintaining his innocence in the Watergate case. In December 7th, the White House can't explain an 18 and a half minute gap in one of the subpoenaed tapes. So they have to hand over the tapes. Finally, uh, the, the Supreme Court said they had to do it. And when they do, um, there's just time missing in the tape. And it's like, well, well, what happened there? Why is there a gap? And there's no real answer for that. Um, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, let's see here. Um, Jared. Can you read this last slide? Uh, 1974. Uh, July 24th, United States versus Richard Nixon. The Supreme Court rules unanimously that Nixon must turn over the tape recordings of 64 White House conversations, rejecting the president's claims of executive privilege. August 18th, Richard Nixon becomes the first U.S. president to resign vice president. Gerald R. Ford assumes the country's highest office. He will later pardon Nixon of all charges related to the Watergate. Okay. And I didn't even mention, you know, there's other people that resigned and were fired. The vice president was implicated in this. He also resigned. Um, so that's why Ford became, Ford wasn't even vice president. He became vice president uh, after Agnew, the previous vice president, resigned. Uh, so the whole thing is is just a, a huge mess that goes to the Supreme Court. And finally, um, it looked really clear by August 8th, and here's the big thing to know. It looked really clear that Congress was going to not only um, to not only impeach Nixon, but to remove him from office. Uh, you guys know, I mean, Trump was impeached uh, this time, but he was not removed from office um, and in the last you know, year or so. Um, it looked clear that this was going to happen to Nixon, that he was going to be impeached and removed from office. Um, and so Nixon uh, is the only president ever to step down. He's forced to step down. So what's kind of the big takeaway from Watergate? And this is where we're going to end this. Um, what what a, the big ta takeaway? This is another example of what we've talked about before, a loss of faith in American government, that the American people – were more kind of jaded with their government, um, their the political leaders. There's a loss of faith in the office of the president. That's why I have the quotes, loss of faith in the office of the president and in politicians. Okay. Um, and so we're going to, I want you to keep these things in mind as we move into the rest of American history. Watergate is really kind of this time to where like people's, people can become more cynical, more jaded because after Kennedy's assassination, and that kind of begins the process. And then Vietnam, and why do we fight this war? And who, why do we lose this war? And, and why do we think about all of that? Um, and were we doing good things over there? And then Watergate. These things leave American people much more jaded toward their government. But people kind of tend to have two different responses to it. One response is we need a totally different kind of government uh, and people go, you know, to the left side on that and, and want a government that's going to be very different from the one they've had before. And that government is actually going to have more power and going to do things and going to totally change society in a new way. And so this is kind of the the far left uh, reaction to Watergate. Um, and then there's the other one that's like kind of the far right reaction to to all these things, to Watergate, to Vietnam, to uh, to all these things that make people doubt their faith in government. The other response is, let's have l far less government. 
uh, what you would call kind of the libertarian response um, to kind of doubt, okay, we want people who are not politicians. We want the government to stay out of our business. You know, these kind of responses to, uh, to events like Watergate. So, I mean, I, Trump is a great example because people considered it, many Americans considered it one of Trump's great virtues that he had no political experience because they believed politicians were corrupt. And so they chose someone who had never been elected to anything ever. I don't know. Maybe he was like student body vice president or something. I have no idea. Um, right? He had no political experience whatsoever. Um, but it's not just Trump. I mean, this happens with the, with the next presidential election. Jimmy Carter is has very limited political experience, none in Washington. Ronald Reagan in the 1980s was an actor with you know with limited political experience and no experience in Washington. Um, you start seeing this kind of like Washington is corrupt and evil. Uh, we need lead, leaders from outside of that. And some people are like, we need you know people on the left. Some people are like, we need the government to be small. But regardless, you know, Watergate is a kind of a huge player in the way people see government and their loss of faith in government. I hope that makes sense to you guys. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, wake up, Jenna. Unmute yourself. I'm awake. I've been awake. <laughs> yeah. It's just kind of fun to say. I don't get to say that. <laughs> Get your head off your desk. Get to work. Okay, I'm done. I'm going to stop recording. Um, let me see here. Um, stop recording. Okay.